Hi everyone, uh, I'm James. Um, for anyone uh, visually impaired watching this, I'm, I'm a white male. I'm in my late 30s. I have a bald head uh, and a sort of black and grey beard and I'm wearing headphones. And uh, today I have the pleasure on this week's episode of the Keywords Cast to be talking to Reese Lloyd, who is the studio head at Descriptive Video Works. Hello, Reese. Hi, thanks, James. Uh, uh, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Reese Lloyd. I am a white male in my late 40s. I have uh, gray hair and a white beard, uh, and I've got white uh, old school iPhone headphones in my ears. Wonderful. And I, you know, in addition to, 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 the, to the visual description, um, Reese, it would be great if you could kick off our conversation today and, uh, and describe your role at Descriptive Video Works and, and, the, and the wider Keywords family. For sure. Uh, so I'm the studio head for Descriptive Video Works. We are a company that specializes in audio description, uh, which is a more artful form of what James and I just did by way of self-introduction. So uh, audio description is the uh, service of providing visual information uh, from uh, video content to people who are uh, blind or low vision or anyone who uh, desires it, who may benefit from it, whether they are, uh, whether they are blind or low vision, whether they're uh, migraine sufferers who want to close their eyes while they watch TV, whether they be uh, distracted TV viewers, people who are on their laptops or their phones while they're watching TV, people who are cooking in their kitchen, uh, any number of people who could benefit from audio description, we provide that service, uh, and um, and we are part of uh, accessibility initiatives within keywords as well. So global, I mean, we just had Global Accessibility Awareness Day, um, which which is a fantastic you know occasion for us to talk and and to share some details about how, how um, DVW plays its part in making media more accessible to to the visually impaired communities. Uh, was it that was that the initial goal that really led to the formation of the company? Sure. So we were founded in 2003. Uh, our founder's uh, name is Diane Johnson, and uh, she identified that um, there was a real gap, especially uh, we're based in Canada. Our studio is in Vancouver, and um, there was some early uh, audio description efforts in certain countries in in the, uh, there was some progress. It was originated in the United States, but there was uh, some really rapid progress in, in the UK. But there wasn't really a service in Canada at the time. And so Diane identified that there, this was a service that was really valuable and really important. She was connected to some people in the community who were blind or low vision. And so she formed the company out of that uh, sense of need. And so um, that was really where it, it came from. She um, she was the founder, and and she built it from there. And and since then, it's grown into uh, a company that does uh, audio description in eight different languages for <laughs> millions of TV viewers all around the world. I think. I mean, the be clearly the best the best way to, for people to understand those who aren't familiar with audio description as, as a medium already, the, the best way for them to uh, understand it, I think, is to hear your work in, in a clip. So I'm going to play a short video um, and then it would be great if you could talk us through. I'm interested to hear how this format has developed and, and how it helps sure. the visually impaired. So just to describe what's going to happen now, Reese and I are going to leave the screen and we're going to play a video uh, with, uh, of, of some of the team's work. An animated female pilot rescues a woman. Ready? Six years ago I met a pilot. Birds flee from pine trees. She saved my life. The pilot reaches down, touching a beast-sized footprint in the mud. <sighs> She and the injured woman see wreckage near their helicopter. Inside the aircraft, a lantern illuminates a first aid kit. The pilot wraps gauze around the woman's hand. She takes a seat. That symbol, what does it mean? <laughs> this jacket was my father's. Dagu Wakan, Wichachpi. The creator's star has many meanings. Love, wisdom, bravery. Shoots you. Listen, I need to get this bird in the air. You try to get some rest. Yo, the bus. The pilot covers the woman with her father's jacket and leaves her to sleep. Later that night, the pilot works on repairs underneath the cockpit outside. 
Vapor exhales from her mouth as her strands of hair blow in the wind. She quickly looks behind her toward a pitch black forest. The pilot opens the hatch and readies a flare gun. What's happening? She searches around, then raises her arm skyward. Red light fills the area. The pilot's eyes widen as a huge bear races forward and slams her unconscious. It tosses her away, then tries to attack the injured woman inside. A rock hits the bear. The bear turns as the pilot loads another flare. She faces it and raises the gun as the bear charges forward. Now at an airfield... Wait, that's it? What happened next? <laughs> Why don't you ask her yourself? The pilot hovers above the rescued woman, who now tells her tale to another. Words appear over a forest. North Star. Thunderbird joins Team Nomad. North Star starts next week. Okay, so Reese and I are, are back on the screen now. And uh, yeah, Reese, uh, it'd be great for you to elaborate of, of what we've just seen and heard. Sure. So, so the standard process of creating um, audio description or, or what's called described video in Canada is uh, we get a video clip uh, from one of our clients. Uh, it can be a short form like what you saw. Uh, it can be something longer, anything from a, a series of TV shows to uh, to a feature film. And, uh, and we uh, have a, a roster of writers who specialize in writing the descriptions. So these are people who come from a variety of backgrounds, whether they be screenwriters or technical writers or um, poets or teachers, or just it's a it's an array of skills that they they uh, started with and they've uh, they've been trained. They've uh, learned this craft over many years. Many of our writers have been doing this for uh, over ten years. Many of them actually have been with uh, the company since Diane formed it back in two thousand and three. And they're really specialists at taking um, the visual in information and uh, taking that medium and then uh, and then extracting the key visuals to keep the story going, to make sure that it's uh, that the the blind or low vision you, viewer can be really engaged in the program, whether that be environmental descriptions, whether that be actions that characters are taking. Sometimes it's like, identifying something on screen early in a program that's not going to be relevant until later in that program, but making sure that we've planted the seed of like visual information that a sighted viewer would be, would have access to. We've provided that description for a blind or low vision viewer. And so that, that's the first stage. And it's the, really the fundamental stage is, is, is the description writing. Um, without a great uh, described script, you're not going to get great audio description. So we take a lot of pains with uh, ensuring that we have the, the best AD writers in the business and uh, that they have the time and the, the uh, experience and, and all of the, the what they need to support them in doing the best job possible. It then moves into a studio, a recording studio, where we have a narrator uh, work with a recording engineer and that they do a directed session uh, and uh, lay down the, the narration tracks. So they often work through, um, uh, they often work through um, the script in sort of a linear format. So they basically go from event to event, but they are also watching the program. Usually the narrators have never seen the show beforehand. So they are, they are doing their descriptions in real time, responding to what they see on screen, which is a, a, another incredible feat on their part, that they are able to sort of, with their voices, transmit this description and convey the, the mood of the, of the program, the themes of the program through, through their delivery. Um, and then, um, and oftentimes that, that voice is cast by with through us by the with the client. So we work with the clients to make sure that if they have a specific, uh, we have a quite a large roster of narrators, and so we provide them some different samples that they get to choose. Sometimes we choose ourselves when we always whether we're sort of like organizing the casting or casting ourselves. We always try to ensure uh, appropriate voice casting. I can get into what that actually means uh, if you want. But um, we have some great narrators who've been also doing this for a long time. Um, and 
then it moves into the mixing studio where one of our uh, really experienced uh, AD mixers, some of whom have been, again, this is a repeat story with Descriptive Video Works, but this has been a company that's been a, this core group of people who've been doing this for almost 20 years. So our, our mixing engineers have more than a decade of experience um, and they will take the original audio, they will take the recorded narration track and they will mix them together. And that's what you will get when you select the audio described track on Netflix or Disney Plus or Amazon or wherever. Um, and I'm 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 assuming here. I mean, this this could only have been developed in a you know, relatively short space of time. This could only have been developed with the collaboration and feedback from the blind and low vision community. Yeah. So audio description was actually started by blind people for blind people. So it originated back in, I mean, it, was, it goes back a little bit earlier if you go back into the theater days, but uh, it sort of start, first started as an art form in theater. But uh, in terms of TV, it started in the 90s. There was a company called WGBH, um, their PBS station in the United States. They, they were the ones who first started uh, audio description and um, they pioneered that piece. And then it, obviously the art form has evolved uh, over time as everything does. Um, we certainly do, uh, we work really closely as, as sort of visual media has changed so much over this time. Back then it was broadcast in feature film only really. And now it's, it's there's so much video content on the internet, whether it be streaming providers, whether it be YouTube, whether it be embedded videos on general websites, uh, you know, there's just round the clock. There's so much video content out there, uh, and it and it and it's ballooned into lots of different areas. And so we work really closely with an advisory council. Um, they are people who uh, work with Descriptive Video Works to make sure that we are getting the best guidance we can from a, a really diverse group of people from the blind and low vision community. Uh, we meet regularly, uh, we meet regularly virtually, and then we also correspond uh, constantly via email. Um, they also provide some QC services for us uh, on certain programs. And uh, we have people who are video game experts. We have people who are sports experts. We have people who are assistive technology experts. We just had a really fascinating conversation just uh, last week. We, we had a, a advisory council meeting and we got into a, con a, a whole conversation about advertisement and uh, how ad content and branding and and the difference between sort of tokenism and representation. And so these things are really important lessons for us as uh, sighted people to to take on board because you know it, the lived experience that they have is so valuable in creating the service that we uh, that we produce. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, as a sighted person, and um, I think you touched on this earlier actually by talking about flagging things on the screen that might be important later on mm -hmm. than, than the story. Have there ever have there been any other pieces of feedback or things that you've learned from from the community that have been that have made you been like, huh, I. Yeah, I never would have thought of that, but it, it totally makes sense. Constantly. I mean, uh, I, I think about it a lot. I mean, it's my, it's my <laughs> job to think about it. But um, I, I, in terms of, I mean, it, it varies uh, from uh, whether it be things in a specific program that matter, um, you know, or whether it be uh, just the, the sort of areas that audio description can touch that matter. I, I when when I was first started meeting with the advisory council, I I said to them, look, I you know I want my our our motto at Descriptive Video Works is is describe everything. Now, <laughs> we don't have the bandwidth to describe every piece of video content. There's thousands of hours being uploaded every minute, but uh, but we do believe we need to work towards a world where that barrier comes down, and so. Um, but in terms of where we send, put our energy, we want to put our energy into things that that make the most impact. And so, uh, my my pitch to them was really, I'm I'm limited only by uh, the limits of my own imagination or the things that I encounter in my life that I think, hey, that should be described. That could be something we could do. And so, uh, opening myself up to like learning what the experiences are that blind and low vision people are having, where they could really benefit from. 
um, from description, mm-hmm. whether that be speaking to someone who's recently visited a theme park and that was not an accessible experience for them, whether it was a museum, whether it's, um, you know, the safety videos on cruise ships, whether it be, you know, there's like uh, people are buying houses and, you know, there's all, especially during the pandemic, there's been this huge movement to like videos of houses that really give you an in-depth view of what the house is. Well, for a blind or low vision consumer or house buyer, those are inaccessible. And so it's just a a matter of like making sure that we, we open our, our view to the widest possible scope. Um, and then beyond that, you know, definitely things within the program. We, we get into these things a lot. Like uh, we had, uh, we've had lots of really interesting conversations about race and describing race and, and physical characteristics in audio description. It's uh, been a long held uh, tenet of audio description that you, uh, that you describe race only when it's plot relevant. Um, and when we started meeting with uh, blind and low vision people of color to talk about that, their their feedback was really important in, in generating some changes we made to our own style guide uh, in terms of our recognition that representation has to ride alongside that sort of plot relevance, that sometimes something that isn't plot relevant still matters, oftentimes. And so we we've made some efforts to to sort of shift the, that and and also to to promote that more broadly within our industry. We don't we we don't feel that is necessarily a change that D- DVW needs to make explicitly. We want it to be something that that AD service providers everywhere are, are sort of tackling. Uh, I understand. Yeah, I mean it's. Um... At the beginning, you described it as you know the, the simplest possible definition. Describe everything. I mean, I love that. But then, yeah. but obviously, the editorial decisions that then go into actually producing a piece of work, you know, are, are almost endless. Um, and so, something that I yeah, I mean, you've touched on it again, but I wanted to get a bit more into with you though. So, depending on what it is that you're describing, so let's say it's a it's a TV drama versus something like a sports event like the olympics which which uh, I, I i believe you, you did and also live which is uh mm-hmm. which is incredible but for the you know for the for the let's you know for the person who's you know receiving the media um what are the nuances that they're kind of looking for is it uh, do you have to be more of one thing for sports and less of another thing for, for drama or yeah so so this is really the like um, when I say that audio description writers, that's where the that's the heart of the matter. These are people who have <laughs> developed this ability to handle multiple genres, like and and content types, and and absolutely. So so the like describing uh, something like Mr. Bean and describing a, a medical documentary, they might be described by the same person. They might be written by the same person, but obviously the approach is very different in terms of like what, you, how you engage the viewer. Because Mr. Bean, we're not the we're not the comedy in Mr. Bean. However, so much of that comedy is visual that we have to take efforts to sort of translate the joy of watching that physical comedy to a, a blind or low vision viewer. Um, the you know when we look at at something like a documentary our job is more informative it's not as much emotional depending on i mean obviously certain documentaries you get into sort of territory that is a bit more emotive but um and then uh you you look at dramas and 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 comedies and and there's sort of uh and romance stories and and they all have the the and but it's a really important thing to to point out that the, the the tonality that we bring to it is very subtle we are not trying to compete with the program. We are not. Um, we are not trying to really join the program. When our narrators are 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 laying down their their recording, they are not. We have very strict rules about like you don't be performative. That you are not one of the cast members. This is not. This is not an acting exercise. This is really. It, it, there's a really subtle art to letting the tension of a show like Breaking Bad come through in your narration without it being like 
you getting really into the show and 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 competing with you know the the actors in the show so um and then when you talk about live that's a completely different beast altogether uh you're right we are so we've pioneered live audio description for broadcast uh we've done everything from the olympics to political debates to award shows and product launches and you know we we again let's describe everything if people want to just come to us and ask for us to to describe it we're happy to to accommodate um we have uh some of the same people who uh write our scripts also do live uh, audio description we have some who are specialists in certain areas of live like sports and uh we work with them exclusively in that area um that is a, a case where we try to get as much information in, in advance as possible. We don't always succeed. Um, and uh, we, so we have as much information in, of research as possible, but we, what we don't know is when, they're gonna, when the primary people on screen are going to stop talking so that we can actually insert our descriptions. So we might know that if we're doing the Macy's 4th of July parade, we might get a running order of the floats but we don't know when the host is actually going to take a breath so that we can insert the description of this float or that float. Um, and uh, that's even more pronounced in, in sort of sports where quite often the broadcasters are, are filling lots of airtime. There's often like two or three of them on air. And so the opportunities, the gaps are really distinct. Um, and even within the area of sports, so when we did the Olympics, we did them for uh, CBC uh, in Canada and we did them for NBC in uh, the United States. And we did both the Olympics and Paralympics. And it was something like, I don't know, 460 hours of content for NBC and, and uh, something a little bit less than that for CBC. It was, but it was in that same vicinity. And... Um, and this is working with on what like 50 different sports across the summer and winter Olympics and Paralympics and uh, you know, dozens of different announcers trying to figure out when they're going to take a break. And you probably never really heard the bobsled announcing team until you're doing bobsled audio description. And so like on the fly, trying to adjust your approach and different sports, whether they, you can't take the same approach to describing figure skating as you can to something like, you know, uh, javelin. So it, you really have to uh, adapt. And each sport really requires its own approach. We've been working with other broadcasters um, on specific approaches to things like soccer or football, if you prefer, uh, or rugby uh, or baseball, and just the, the different ways in which we have to adapt our description to that sport is vital. But then equally, the, the challenge of learning the sort of the patterns of speech of the primary announcers, because it's really important. We believe it's really important that the blind and low vision audience get the best experience of the primary content while also being supported by audio description. And so we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, like, we, we try our best not to step on the primary announcers. Sometimes we have to because something distinctly visual has happened on screen that nobody has described. And so we'll have to say, like, you know, uh, you know, the, the soccer ball uh, deflected off of the defender's right shin and went into the, the corner of the net uh, past the goalkeeper's outstretched left arm or something along those lines that if if the primary announcer hasn't said that that's what happened then it's our duty to provide that information and sometimes that means some overlap but uh but we really try to be very concise and interject like field position or a player identification or the emotion of the players that's often one of the things that's really left out of sports broadcast is like when you see uh a hockey player take off his helmet and the steam that's coming off of their heads because they're working so hard. That's something that's visual information that we get as sighted viewers that isn't conveyed by the primary announcer. They don't, they don't call attention to that because it's so commonplace as visual thing for them as sighted people watching a sport. But it's all, it's all truly fascinating. I, um, it's the thing I love about doing these talks, actually, on a weekly basis. I, I go into them and I have a headline understanding of what various people from 
keywords do and then um we get into all the nuance and the complexity and it's uh it's it's i, I learn a lot so so that thank you for sharing and um i suppose because we we talk you know dvw as being part of, of keywords um you know, we, we think about a game content because uh, keywords works sure. on a lot of media entertain media and entertainment but also you know perhaps primarily known within gaming uh and I'm aware that you've worked on some game trailers, mm -hmm. uh, but the mind naturally wonders, you know, could we ever see you work on audio description for an actual game or, or even a game that is fundally, fundamentally designed around audio description? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't that be such a milestone mm -hmm. for accessibility? So, so to answer the last part first, there are specific audio games. Mm -hmm. uh, they are designed specifically as audio medium. Um, uh, and uh, we haven't worked on any specifically, but that, that is a that's a there are studios that develop games like that. Uh, yet yeah, we've been working on game trailers for quite some time. Um, we really so we, when we looked at at video games, this was a couple of years ago. We first started looking at at how to make uh, video gaming more accessible, and we talked to a ton of people about it. And there was a lot of sort of barriers put up about making things accessible uh for blind and low vision people through through audio description and part of that were sort of technical limitations part of that were fundamental sort of barriers of we well nobody's ever done that before so how do you do that um and 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 you know gaming studios have a lot on their plate and so the idea of like taking on one more variable or unknown that might impact their delivery or whatever it might be yeah, they, there was some you know some reluctance um but fortunately we found a really good entry point with trailers it's a linear medium much like tv or film in terms of like you get a, a cut piece of content they're often obviously very you know they're short and there's lots of intense action in a lot of them that that uh but that's really that's great for a describer because there's a ton of different things to describe uh it does make some challenges in terms of like there's so much how do you fit it all in but um but so the the in terms of in 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 terms of game trailers that was a good entry point and uh we started to to have lots of conversations with different studios as we handled some of their trailers um and then but then we have seen some progress and we work really closely with some uh blind gaming consultants as well um we've we've seen some progress towards in-game audio description i can't for non-disclosure agreements purposes talk about anything specific but i can tell you we have actually done it it's been completed it hasn't been released but it's been done and we are having uh two or three other conversations with different studios about in-game audio description so we're really hopeful that um we we're we're hopeful that soon there will be some, you know, something concrete that we can say about it. Uh, but also, we're also hopeful that that in this sort of um, atmosphere of supporting that, you know, everybody can play, um, that there is a there's a wider adoption of uh, audio description services in gaming. It is um, it's a challenge, right? There's there's some limitations to what kind of games can be described and and how dynamic a, a game can be. Uh, and how do you do that? How, how do they program the description we provide? Is it for cutscenes or cinematics only, or can it be more dynamic than that? Can it shift with the changes of a player? Um, but some of these questions are being solved in real time as we speak. Wonderful. Well, I, so it's so it's coming, James. It's coming. I am, and I, I wait with bated breath. And I and I really hope. I mean, not just. For you, I say, you know, more more so for for the blind gaming community that that, mm -hmm. that, that is a ripple effect, and that um, uh, and that we do see more. Um, yeah, we uh, we we look obviously descriptive of yours. We we want to. We're really proud of our record pioneering different things. Um, you know, and uh, we're keen to continue to do that in different avenues. But we really what what our core mission is like. When you set when you set the task of describing everything, we know that we're not capable of describing everything. So we also just want to like lift everybody else up in in this arena and go, hey, let's collab, let's work together to make sure that everything gets described. Let's work in this world to make sure that we are more inclusive of of blind and low vision people in everything we we produce. 
I'm going to wrap us up now, Reese, because we're um, we're coming up to the thirty minute mark. But I am um, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, it's a sure. personal question. It's one that I ask everybody actually every week, um, and it's pretty simple. It's it's that what are the parts of your job that you that you cherish the most? Um, so, it, <laughs> uh, it's timely. So mm -hmm. w when uh, so we just had this advisory council meeting and. Um, you know, I, I, I've been working in sort of film post-production for, let's call it 25 years. I don't know. I haven't done the calculation recently. Um, and uh, the vast majority of that time I've been in sort of roles that put me in the sort of expert position. I'm the expert at this or I'm the expert at that. Um, and uh, this has been a really incredible opportunity to, to learn so rather than, you know, me being in a position of expertise, me being in a position of ignorance, but that's ignorance I'm looking to 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 push down and 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 keep adding some learning to to my plate. And so, uh, I love speaking to the audience, the community of people who consume audio description. I love hearing from them, even if they're saying something we did was was less than optimal. I love hearing it. I want to know. I want to, and it's a really passionate community of consumers, and um, and so elevating their voice so that they're able to you know connect to us, but also connect to the people who are you know making content. I think that's really really important, and and so. Uh, my opportunity to, to, to speak to people who consume what we do and are passionate about it is my favorite part of my job. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Reese. I really appreciate your time and and for everything that, that you do. It's um, I think you know you're really enriching people's lives. So um, we appreciate you. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions uh, for for Reese, then please leave them um, in the comments below this video, and we will get back to you. Thanks again. Thanks so much, James. It was a pleasure.